I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel braces for Palestinian violence ahead of the Passover holiday. The case of former IDF soldier Elor Azaria takes yet another controversial turn. And if you can't stop streaming TED Talks either, then you'll definitely want to know what's about to go down in Tel Aviv. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The festival of Passover begins next week, and here in Israel, families are already stocking up on food to prepare for the festivities. And unfortunately, this holiday is also a dangerous time for Israelis, though, as terrorists have historically ramped up attempted attacks on Passover Eve. While the IDF is expecting massive-scale protests along the borders of Gaza and the West Bank this year, and is bracing for impact accordingly. The Palestinians have been accelerating protests in the wake of President Trump's controversial Jerusalem decision, but next week's mass march of return demonstration, set to collide with the eve of Passover, could be the largest rally in quite some time. The overlap with Passover is actually a bit of a coincidence, but for Palestinians, March 30th is the day they commemorate Land Day, the anniversary of Israel's decision to expropriate land in the Galilee in 1976. These protests have often spilled over into violent confrontations with Israeli forces, sometimes ending in gruesome casualties of Palestinian protesters. Now, right now, the Palestinian Authority is in a very difficult position. With foreign aid dwindling and the attempted reconciliation with Hamas at a standstill, Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas has just lashed out with blame, calling out both Hamas and the United States Ambassador David Friedman for the diminishing progress of the Palestinian agenda. Though talks with Hamas have been stalling for months, things took a potentially game-ending turn for the worse just last week. That was when the PA's Prime Minister, Rami Hamdallah, was visiting the Strip to help inaugurate a new facility, only to be nearly assassinated with a bomb going off by his envoy. Indeed, rumors of Hamas infighting as well as outside terror cells attempting to derail the reconciliation have been circulating. But Abbas says Hamas is directly to blame for allowing last week's attack to happen at all, a position that even Israel takes when it comes to security in the Strip. At the same time, Abbas has accused America's ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, of giving free reign to Israeli settlements in the West Bank. The leader referred to Friedman as, quote, the son of a dog, and Friedman had only this to say in response. I observed this morning that three Jews were killed in cold blood by the Palestinian terrorists, and the reaction from the Palestinian Authority was deafening. No condemnation whatsoever. I pointed that out without further adjectives, without further commentary. Abu Mazen chose to respond while, Mr. while Ambassador Lauder was speaking. I had a chance to see his response on my iPhone. His response was to refer to me as a son of a dog. Anti-Semitism or political discourse? Not for me to judge. I leave that all up to you. President Trump's Middle East advisor Jason Greenblatt has also blasted Abbas's remarks on Twitter, urging the leader to abandon his, quote, hateful rhetoric and perhaps choose, quote, practical efforts to improve the quality of life of his people and lead them to peace, end quote. Now, private individuals and businesses alike are all now scrambling to answer the question, how am I affected in the wake of United States President Trump's major overhaul of the tax code? Well, here to help us all get into compliance is Doug Stransky, United States tax partner at Zag s and Thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure to Thanks, have you. Thanks, Aaron. Pleasure to be here. All right, so my first question is, you know, what are, what are the major changes in the tax code this year, if you can kind of sum up some of them? Sure. Well, for uh, Israeli corporations that in, mm -hmm. are investing in the United States, the United States has now gone from one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world to one of the lowest corporate tax rates. For individuals, we've lowered um, the individual tax rate. It's still uh, relatively high, yeah. but it is somewhat of an improvement. So you're saying for like expatriates, it's, it's maybe even an improvement in the tax code, but 
uh, and and for companies as well, if it's a lower if it's a lower corporate tax rate. No. Well, yeah. Well, for individuals that are you know expatriates, it's probably a little better just because of the lower rates. But corporations sure. is a significant uh, advantage now because our tax rate was upwards of forty percent. It's now twenty one percent. Okay, so now what does Zag S and W do? Kind of, you know, what is your position uh, now with this new uh, tax revelation and all these new Israeli companies working in the states, etc.? Sure. Well, we we work with both Israeli, you know, Israeli companies that are investing in the United States, sure. and our and we try to help them um, set up in the most tax efficient structure and provide them all the tax and legal advice that they need to uh, to get going. And that's and that's something that you're actually doing in a in a conference later this week, if I understand Sure. Correctly. Yes, we're we're giving a, a conference on U.S. Uh, tax reform, uh -huh. and uh, we're going to be talking to a number of uh, CFOs about uh, investment in the United States in light of the tax reform. Oh man! All right. So uh, now, what exactly? What do you think is is maybe the negatives of this tax reform? How are people? What what do we want to watch out for if if I you know own a business abroad? Well, for corporations, there really aren't very many negatives because of the reduced tax rate. There are also some additional benefits in the United States in that you can uh, fully deduct uh, mm -hmm. capital investments and that sort of thing. But for individuals, um, especially individuals that own companies here in Israel, the new tax law provides a significant disadvantage because in the past, individuals were able to defer the U.S. taxation of foreign earnings. As a result of the new tax law, they're going to be taxed immediately without any benefit of credits for taxes that are paid here in Israel. I see. All right, so uh, I guess my final question is, you know, if we want to get in touch with S&W, you know, Zag S and W. What what are the services that you'll provide for and for everybody? Is any, everybody kind of we, available to come to you? Oh, absolutely. We work with both uh, individuals and corporations, okay. uh, U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens, and and we can provide uh, right. you know uh, the advice and coordination with Israeli advisors. All right. Well, you'll definitely be hearing from me in the very, in the coming weeks. Sounds uh, good. Thank you so much for coming. Sure, in, my Doug pleasure. Spansky. All right, now Cambridge Analytica is a data gathering firm that customizes ads and online marketing based on information it gathers from your likes and views on social media. But the company has just come under fire for allegedly abusing that same data to sway the 2016 presidential election for the Trump campaign. In fact, according to official campaign records, the Trump camp paid Cambridge Analytica around $6 million. The plot thickens even further because the man who ran Trump's campaign and was his chief strategist until recently, Steve Bannon, was also the company's vice president at one time. In a breaking twist in the scandal, the current CEO of Cambridge Analytica has just been revealed on hidden camera, boasting of his company's tricks, which include bribery, stings, honey traps, and spies to influence the election. CEO Alexander Nix specifically mentions using, quote, Israeli companies, end quote, for these tactics. Um, some British companies, we're using um, Israeli companies. Israeli people? Israeli? From Israel? From Israel. Right. Very effective in terms of what's The company denies any such criminal activity, and the Trump campaign denies abusing any data obtained by Cambridge Analytica. But following the New York Times report that the company had misused data obtained from nearly 50 million Facebook users, Facebook immediately suspended Cambridge Analytica for violating policy. Many have criticized Facebook for remaining largely silent amidst accusations of perpetuating, even inadvertently, a cloud of misinformation that may have swayed the election in favor of Trump. This scandal is likely to continue unfolding in the days to come. The controversial case of former IDF soldier Elora Zaria has just taken another twist that's already inciting new debate. The IDF's parole board has just announced that Azaria will go free from prison this May after serving just two-thirds of his full prison sentence. This case first ignited a global media firestorm back in 2016. At the time, Azaria was a sergeant in the IDF, serving in the occupied West Bank city of Hebron. On March 24th of that year, Azaria arrived at the scene of a Palestinian stabbing attempt on an IDF soldier. But nearly 11 minutes after the attacker had been disarmed, shot, and incapacitated by soldiers, Azaria was caught on tape delivering the fatal gunshot to the Palestinian in custody. The ensuing scandal and 14-month manslaughter sentence, though, made some declare Zaria a hero and demand his full pardon. Others condemned the courts for allegedly excusing what is essentially murder. Azaria himself petitioned for a pardon and a reduced sentence in the past, requests that were denied, citing Azaria's failure to express any remorse. Regardless, the gesture of freeing him several months short of his full sentence is a very symbolic move for the courts to make. 
one that even further divides Israelis on opposite sides of this table. Now, when people abroad hear the word Israel, there is sometimes a lot of baggage that comes with it. And while the political issues in Israel are often under the world's microscope, truth is that a lot of Israelis finishing the army and traveling abroad have almost nothing to do with it. Well, ILTV's Natasha Kirchuk got an exclusive look at how the army is now helping newly released soldiers prepare for some of those more awkward questions. Take it away, Natasha. Isn't, isn't it dangerous? What? To be in Israel? No. So what's it like? You, you said you were in the army? Yeah. So, so you've killed people, right? No, didn't kill people. So hold on, what type of army is an like army that doesn't kill people? Well, I don't want to give you my name. I know you guys kind of really aren't tourists. What? what? You guys aren't tourists. Why not? Well, we know. You, you're working with the Mossad, no? <laughs> okay, these questions may sound ridiculous, but the truth is this is exactly what many Israelis deal with when they travel. Would you know how to respond? I'm a little bit uh, scared sometimes to tell that I'm an Israeli because when you are in the army, the first thing they tell you when you go to travel, don't tell that you are Israeli. Here in Israel, it's a pretty known thing. You go to high school, then you serve in the army for your obligatory two to three, maybe even more years, and then you travel to celebrate being discharged. There are over 400,000 young Israelis between the ages of 20 to 24 that travel abroad every year. And today they're learning how to talk about Israel while they're traveling, all as part of a new mandatory program in the Israeli army called Israel Is. What's it like to just live in a desert with, I, I met another Israeli on another trip, they said they had a camel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not uh, exactly right. Eyal Biram is one of the three elite IDF veterans that founded the program, who realized he himself wasn't prepared to deal with questions about his own country when he traveled to East Asia after serving in the army. The IDF involved because they understand that the soldiers that finish the army have to understand that they are an ambassadors of Israel if they want and if they don't want to. But can the politics truly be removed from Israel, especially when almost every single Israeli is required to join the Israeli military? This is absolutely not a political program. We are teaching the soldiers to speak about the country they came from. It's not about right or left. It's about is Israel really needs to exist. Israel can be an explosive topic, so it really helps me to get a little bit of practice. So I will know how to approach the subject more better. Israel is has already trained around 7,000 soldiers in its first year with the goal to reach 40,000 by the end of 2018. Israel is a country of 8.6 million different opinions. And, and that's what we're representing here is the discussion and the arguments and the challenges that face Israel today. As we know, Iran maintains a strict boycott against any kind of diplomacy with Israel. The country even goes so far as to ban or punish its national athletes from competing against Israelis in international competitions. Well, here's a story that goes against all the hate. An Iranian soccer captain and an Israeli soccer star have just posed alongside one another for a very rare photo opportunity. Israel's star player Maor Buzaglo uploaded the pic on Twitter a few days ago, writing, quote, In soccer, the rules are different, and there is one language without prejudice and wars. The captain of the Iranian team and I prove another way is possible, end quote. That's definitely the sentiment we're seeing too, now that the photo's going viral. Iranian-born soccer captain Ashkan Dejaga plays for England's Nottingham Forest, and the pair posed for this photo in London while Buzaglo was actually getting treated for an injury. Though Iran hasn't made any official statement, the potential of a consequence for Dejaga is very real. The player actually refused to travel to Israel while playing for Germany's team about 10 years ago, but not because he had any problems with the Jewish state. Rather, he feared for his family's well-being if he crossed the regime's blockade. Iranian players and coaches have sparked controversy recently for misconduct against and boycotting of Israeli athletes for years now. But hopefully photos like this mean the seeds of friendship will overcome all that hate. Now, 26 years ago, a deadly terror bombing completely destroyed the Israeli embassy in Argentina, killing 29 and injuring 242 more. Well, finally, this weekend, at least some of those wounds started to heal. As for the first time ever, Argentina's government actually co-sponsored a memorial for the embassy bombing alongside Israel. ILTV special correspondent on Latin American affairs, Joy Gavijon, is here now with the story. Joy? Thanks, Aaron. Well, this is definitely a big step forward in coming to terms with that deadly attack so many years ago. 
This terror attack happened almost three decades ago already, but for Argentina to finally step up side by side with Israel and really represent itself at the event this past Friday, it's a very telling and symbolic gesture. Sure. You know, I, I think many Israelis and, and Jews have probably been waiting a long time for Argentina to do exactly that. So yes. tell me, why has it taken the Argentine government so long? You know, why did it take 26 years to see this event? Yes, well, for a lot of reasons. As you know, the previous administrations have been really swamped with allegations of government corruption, the scandal involving Argentina's former president possibly covering up Iran's uh, role in bombing of the Jewish community center. I mean, that's still playing in court right now. And actually, this bombing of the Israeli embassy was the first foreign terror attack in Argentina ever. And Iran, mm. it's believed to be to also have been behind this as well. See, all right. Now, now Friday's ceremony brought together survivors from the 1992 attack as well as families of the fallen victims. Another major symbolic gesture here is that this was the first time that the service was actually conducted at Argentina's Human Rights Center. Correct? Yes. It, this uh, event was usually held at the actual site of the bombing in the past, and the change to the Human Rights Center. It's also a symbolic choice that shows kind of an apology from this current mm -hmm. administration, let's say. And it's important because this building in the 70s and the 80s was actually a detention center wow. used by uh, the dictatorship for torturing political activists who opposed the state. They have since converted it into a museum to remember those harsh lessons learned from the di dictatorship. All right, well, certainly seems like some of these wounds are still very fresh. The culprits behind both the Jewish Community Center bombing and the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires are still unknown at this time, but, yeah. you know, maybe we'll get some of those answers someday soon. We can hope, yes. All right, thank you, Joy. Now, Israel has enormous pride in being perhaps the only Middle East country where LGBTQ citizens can be free to live as they choose. And while that community is still fighting with the state for several key rights and recognitions, the country has just made another impressive first. Eitan Ginsburg has just become Israel's first openly gay mayor. Ginsburg is a long-serving member of the Ra'anana City Council. His work in public service has earned him a lot of fans from the community as well as city leaders and even the city's more conservatively religious sector. So when the previous mayor was reassigned to head the National Housing Authority, the council took a vote and gave Ginsburg this spot in the history books. Now the newly elected mayor is mostly just glad that he got the gig not because of being gay nor in spite of it, but because he proved himself through his hard work. Ginsburg and his partner Yotam have been together for 15 years. Not so long ago, they had a twin son and daughter born via surrogate mother in Portland. On top of these blessings and the new job, Ginsburg is hoping that he can prove himself mayor material when it comes time for re-elections this October. Oh, and as if this wasn't groundbreaking enough, Ginsburg is also currently the country's youngest mayor, so keep up the great work. As transportation gets smarter and smarter, Israel has come out on top in the fields of research and development in autonomous vehicle technology. Well, here now to tell us all about the incredible innovations that we can expect in the, in the years to come is the head of the Ashdod Municipality Industry Development Division and director of the Ashdod Smart Mobility Living Lab, Dr. Smadal Iskovich. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much all right, to invite so, me. Uh, so I'm really excited. You know, <laughs> first of all, tell me about some of the projects that, that you're taking care of in, in Ashdod. So um, Ashdod is a smart city, mm -hmm. and according to our, our uh, vision, the, the vision of the mayor of Ashdod, Dr. Rikhi Lasri, smart city uh, used advanced technology mm -hmm. in order to improve the life, the quality of the life of the residents in the city, trying to improve uh, accessibility, trying mm -hmm. to improve safety, and be more uh, um, politely for the environment. Now, so, so is this, because you just mentioned the environment, but are, are most of the plans geared towards kind of transportation, towards uh, ergonomics of moving about the city, or is it really much more global than that? So it's more global than that. First of all, Ashdod has been chosen by the Ministry of Transportation as a pilot city wow. for smart transportation, a, a public smart transportation. Uh, and we are establishing a very uh, smart road in, uh, in Ashdod City, full of technologies, full sensors, cameras, uh, uh, smart traffic lights called Reway. And al along this road, there are special trails for biking and, uh. for, uh, yes, and for walking. Uh, and third, we, are, uh, we establish a very unique international lab in collaboration with MIT. It function, this lab function is the R&D center that collect uh, a, a very important information 
uh, regarding transportation behavior. This is the mobility living lab that, that you're this talking about? It's called Ashdod Smart Mobility Living Lab, exactly. So, yeah, so can you, you know, what, what processes, what uh, innovations and things have you already sort of enacted in Ashdod, uh, and what have, has the result, the reaction to that been in the city, and, you know, what are, where are you taking it next? So first of all, safety is the, the important thing mm -hmm. in our program. And we started to build a, a digital transportation map that have two purposes. One of them is to build a safe digital map that can really uh, uh, give us uh, information about uh, uh, risks and uh, uh, potential mm -hmm. regarding potential accidents in order to reduce the accidents in the city. And second is to establish an open data source for startups, for a technology company, for researchers, in order to encourage them to do, to do joint venture. Wow. Because we believe that innovation comes through cooperation, and we want to improve always sure. the services that we provide the citizens regarding this hot topic. All right, well, I'm, I'm excited to see what else comes <laughs> out. I guess my absolutely final question, unfortunately, you know, I, I don't have much time left, but uh, when do I get my autonomous car? Oh, so that, there are many opinions about how long it will take, is how it soon? long tens, LA. but uh, um, it will take by step by step, and right. uh, and I think we we are planning a unique land in the road for those uh, um, vehicles, for those smart vehicles. All right. Well, I I can't <laughs> wait to hear more about it. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now speaking of innovation, if you're anything like me, you can't get enough of those amazing TED Talks. The TEDx series brings some of the world's most innovative leaders in everything from technology to art and gives them the floor to talk about how they do their magic. Well, starting tomorrow, TEDx returns to Tel Aviv for the second year. The TEDx Tel Aviv 2018 lineup boasts some of the most amazing Israeli speakers the country has to offer. Right at the top is Ram Bergman, who's basically a god in the cinema and geek world right now for producing the most recent Star Wars film, The Last Jedi. FYI, Bergman is also the producer on the next totally original Star Wars film in the franchise. Maybe he'll spill a few Jedi secrets on stage. Now rounding out the rest of the lineup is Israel's first chief scientist Orna Berry, world-renowned composer and pianist Orit Wolf, and even the platoon leader of the army's elite Givati Brigade, Ziv Shilon. Tickets are already just about sold out for this huge event. It'll cost you 380 shekels, but with a lineup like this, it's totally worth the price. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Tomorrow, we've got a huge lineup for the TEDx Tel Aviv Talks. So today's word is manche, which is how you say host or MC in Hebrew. Ever dreamed of headlining Saturday Night Live? Then you are gunning to be a manche or an MC, my friend. But to have the stuff of a solid manche or mancha if you're a girl, obviously you need to be a pro at what you're doing. And the best manchim or hosts are also usually good with people. Some confidence helps, maybe a large ego, throw in a decent suit and a tie, and voila, you've got a manche. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the, at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear, but with light dust in the winds and a low of about 54 or 12 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow, you can expect warm and mostly sunny skies with a high of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.48 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you for watching.